welcome to participants and panelists a hearty welcome these days uh, we are talking mostly about the corona virus about what government has done about it and what more should be done but there are other issues which are equally important if not more important and of longer term importance and one of them is how do we <clears throat> uh stimulate the environment in favor of manufacturing in the country now i think there is consensus all around among economists and opinion makers that india's manufacturing needs to grow at a rapid pace for the most important reason that we need to provide employment to the vast numbers of job seekers we need to free the agriculture sector of the population overload now manufacturing industries cannot grow without investment and much of it has to come from the private sector from uh, the foreign investors as well as from the domestic investors what we need is to have the appropriate strategy to create the environment for investment and that is the subject before us today to speak on the strategy strategy the appropriate strategy we have distinguished panelists starting with dr santosh mehrotra of jawalal city then uh, dr rajat kathuria who is the chief executive of ecrear which is the institution uh, hosting uh, this uh, uh, webinar and then we have a former secretary industries dipp mr ajay shankar so let us start with uh, and at the end i will come in with some remarks so santosh uh, let me hand over the floor to you Uh, uh dr santosh mehrotra for his powerful right santosh right i am just about to share the screen just give me half a minute can you see the the powerpoint yeah yes. you can sir okay okay super super okay that's what i was trying to achieve okay wonderful i hope you can finish it in 15 minutes i for i'm going to try and do i've got uh, 16 slides sir and that's what i will attempt to do so okay. this uh, give me a second i'll just go to slide show So I'm going to be speaking about eight components of a manufacturing strategy for India. So let me begin by uh, speaking about what, why a manufacturing strategy is needed in the first place. First, you know, because we've been a very services-driven economy, and uh, both in employment as well in, in terms of output, and we seem to have sort of forgotten about manufacturing, which is the strategy which with our planning process began with. <clears throat> so. why should we have a manufacturing strategy in the first place because well productivity in manufacturing is higher than in either agriculture or in services manufacturing is a source of productivity grains across the primary and the tertiary se sectors through the spread of technological change and the, for these reasons manufacturing is an engine of economic growth because it provides greater opportunities for economies of scale for embodying tech technological progress it generates forward and backward linkages with positive spillover effects in in the economy which is the reason why danny rodrick the famous development economist had said uh, <clears throat> that countries with larger manufacturing sectors tend to grow faster and certainly faster growth is what we what we need at this point 
And why do we need a manufacturing strategy now? Well, for a variety of reasons. I mean, manufacturing has slowed. And it's interesting that in the, in the um, 29 years that have passed since, since uh, the 1991 economic reforms, India still does not have an industrial strategy. I mean, 100 countries developed an industrial policy after 2008 global economic crisis, not India. And let me add here that had Make in India been a strategy, a manufacturing strategy, the manufacturing share of GDP would not be stuck at 16%, which is what it has been stuck at since 1991 till date. Um, and because manufacturing has not been growing, manufacturing has not been a lead sector in the economy, for, which is driving growth. So we need to resume a path of structural transformation, and India cannot unlike most other, you know, unlike uh, some countries, some people like, would like to believe, India cannot skip the manufacturing stage. Uh, because a manufacturing policy would actually enable more modern services job growth uh, than has been happening now. What has happened in the Indian economy is that, you know, underemployment has been a long-standing problem. But earlier it was an agricultural feature, but now it it's a, it's a feature which characterizes informal traditional services. Formal jobs are confined to modern services, hardly any in manufacturing, and this is an unsustainable growth strategy. We are adding more than 5 million workers, uh, to, people to the labor force every year. How are we going to absorb them? Which is the reason why we've seen unemployment rise to an unprecedented levels of over 6% in 2018. Um, moving on. Screen has gotten stuck. What's the problem here? Ah, we should remember that you know we have been true laggards in respect of manufacturing. I mean, Malaysia tripled its share of manufacturing value added in GDP from 1960 to 2014 to reach 24 percent. Thailand went from 13 to 33 percent, and even Vietnam and believe it or not, Bangladesh. Bangladesh have seen sharp increases in recent decades. Uh, <clears throat> in Bangladesh, 16% of total employment in the economy is accounted for by manufacturing. Compare that to India's 12%. And in GDP terms, our GDP uh, manufacturing contribution has never exceeded 17%. Um, let me quickly turn to the eight components of what a manufacturing strategy in India could constitute. But I want to say upfront that there are three things that I will not address because I'm hoping other speakers will address. One is regulatory reform in respect of tax administration, et cetera. Uh, not that reforms are not needed. Of course they are. Logistic cost is, is one factor which is undermining our competitiveness. I'm not going to speak about that. And then the real effective exchange rate, which has been appreciating, which is a real problem for our, for our exports generally and, and for manufacturing also. So let me just remind ourselves of what how has the situation been evolving since about 2000 in respect of jobs? The interest, this, is, this is what is showing, this graph is showing how many non-agri jobs were being created between the year 2000 and 2018. Um, so in the first half of the, of the last decade, we were generating seven and a half million new non-agri jobs. And that was also happening during the dream run of our economy when we were growing at 8% per annum and we were generating seven and a half million non-agri jobs and poverty was declining and workers were moving out of agriculture. But look what happened after 2012, that the non-agri jobs total, meaning construction, manufacturing, uh, services taken together have fallen to 2.9 million per annum. <clears throat> now in this, we have to also recognize that you know, manufacturing employment was at least growing not very rapidly until 2012 from about 2000. But what happened after 2012 is catastrophic because it, actually we've seen for the first time in India's development history that there's been an absolute decline in manufacturing employment. Uh, this is the rate of decline per, per annum. <clears throat> so what would a growth strategy for manufacturing consist of? Well, let me start first with an agrarian strategy because agrarian investment would Generate, would, would lead to an endogenous growth model with rising demand for manufacturers coming from a, a agriculture and a 
it would also uh, sort of provide the raw materials for supply. Now, India, unfortunately, is facing a fork in the road in our agrarian strategy. <clears throat> what is that fork in the road? We've had, we've pursued a strategy that involves, you know, MSP prices for outputs and input subsidies. And when these have tended to fail, then, you know, farmers have wanted loan waivers. And then when that has failed, then we, want, we, we went in for PM Kisan, which is an input, input uh, sorry, which is a, um, a, a income strategy, sort of, in, let's give them in, income support. All this implies that, you know, an investment in agriculture t tends to fall by the wayside, something which we've been making a case for for over 10 years. So the strategy that we really need to now adopt is an investment-based model to raise agricultural productivity. We know that China, we, we know the evidence agriculture was four times more effective in poverty reduction than industry and services. And of course, China managed to solve the problems of over... Oh, over uh, excess workers in, in agriculture by moving them out into industry and services. Uh, so I don't have to belabor this point about endogenous growth and how agriculture can play a role. I've already made this point about how low the, <clears throat> the manufacturing share of GDP and employment is. And it has actually fallen back after 2012 from 12.8%, the manufacturing share of employment, to 11.5%. So what went wrong with the 1991 industrial policy statement? Firstly, we must recognize that unlike East Asia, which always had, all the countries had an explicit industrial policy, we have lacked an explicit manufacturing policy for 29 years since 1991. What is the implication of this? How did this show up? <clears throat> well, we rightly reduced tariffs from 150% in 1990 on average to 40% in 1998 to 10% in 2002. But there were three issues in the way we went about doing it. One was the speed itself. It was fast. And unfortunately, we reduced tariffs to levels well below the upper WTO upper bound rates, which affected small and large manufacturers almost uniformly. Secondly, I think the sequence was wrong because we, have, we were an economy which had gotten used to reservations for small-scale industries of 836 products which had started being reserved for them from, two, from 1956. And the tragedy is that post-1991, the number of reserve products fell, but all the way till 2005, we still had 500 products which were still reserved. So what, what was wrong with the sequence? Well, without ending reservation first, we permitted international competition first. Instead of enabling domestic competition to enable SSIs and other, and other big firms to actually compete domestically, we allowed first the international. So our sequence was wrong. And finally, the structure of tariffs. Post the signing of the free trade agreements with uh, Korea, Japan, and the ASEAN countries, what we found was our tariff structure tariff structure began to suffer from what is well known as an inverted duty structure, whereby finished and consumer goods tariffs are, were reduced, so imports flooded in, but tariffs on raw materials and intermediate inputs for domestic manufacturers were higher, so an in, in, uh, inverted duty structure emerged, which I call IDS, which was actually reduced the effective rate of protection, and in fact, in many cases, the effective rate of protection, protection was actually negative. So what, what the first component of, a, of, a man, of, of our industrial policy has to be a coherent manufacturing policy which aligns our export and import policy with our manufacturing goals. Import policy since the early 2000s has simply been unaligned to the manufacturing goal. So we need to correct the IDS duty structure and we need to carefully examine the effective rates of protection. For instance, Effective rates of protection have been negative, as research has shown in, in, in the case of paper and paper products uh, on account of IDS. Chemical products, pharmaceuticals, computers, electronics, optical products, machinery, and other transport equipment. And FICI has been making a noise about this year in year, year out since 2012, but not much was 
it was its voice was not really being heard. Now, what we noticed that uh, you know tariff changes were made since 2014 in electronics, which led temporarily to an improvement in domestic electronics manufacturing. But we all know that all the components are still imported, and in fact, the initial spurt of in of domestic phone production actually uh, was completely wiped out very very soon thereafter. One was hoping that the GST was going to improves the situation of ideas. Well, GST only levels the playing field. It provides a refund of unutilized input tax credits where credit accumulation is due to the inverted duty structure. But a level playing field is still not consistent with the infant industry argument. And unfortunately, uh, the inverted duty structure in most of the above cases have actually has survived. Now contrast this to a situation in the auto sector now, in the auto sector, the country in the last 10 to 15 years has actually become uh, the second, third, or fourth largest manufacturer in the world and a major exporter in two-wheelers, three-wheelers, four-wheelers, and, and even trucks and lorries. And this is because it has never suffered from the phenomenon of an inverted duty structure. The second reason is we had an auto manufacturing plan from 2006 to 16, and then that was extended all the way to 2026. And the pharmaceutical story in which, of course, in, in COVID times, we must remind ourselves, uh, we've become, uh, we, uh, we become uh, quite a powerhouse. We're, well, the same story. So what is the policy implication of this continuing state of ideas? Does it mean raising tariffs? Perhaps but certainly not beyond WTO upper bound. But raising tariffs alone will not transform manufacturing, as I will sort of go on to say, but what are the other gaps? I mean, can we use anti-dumping measures, safeguard measures? But this must be part of a strategy, including you know, the real effective exchange rate, which has been appreciating, which is, which is no good for our manufacturing. Component number two for an industrial strategy. You know, there are five labor intensive industries in our country which create jobs in manufacturing. These are sec sectors, five industries, which account for over 50% of total manufacturing jobs in the country. And these are apparel and garments, textiles, food processing, wood manufacture, manufacturers, and leather and footwear. And clearly, there is much greater potential than we currently have for exports in these sectors, but of course, also. For, you know, to meet growing domestic demand. And in fact, this is exactly what was happening between 2004, 5, and 11, 12, because as, you know, with growth came rising demand, rising wages, and rising jobs, and it raised consumption expenditure on simple manufacturers. So in other words, the endogenous model of growth that I was, I was talking about was very much in evidence between that, in that period from 4, 5 to 11, 12. And these were the five sectors which were actually driving uh, jobs and output in the manufacturing sector and economy. In fact, 45% uh, of India's exports come from the unorganized sector, which create jobs. Um, and absent sector-wise packages, India is losing to Bangladesh, Cambodia. So the, so the point I want to make is it's not that the government didn't act. In garments, there came a package in 2016. In leather, there came a package in 2017. But those un packages, unfortunately, by were wasted by perverse policies. Unfortunately, soon after the garments package, we got demonetization, which destroyed the unorganized sector completely in, a, in garments and other, and other parts of the economy. And in and leather, leather, unfortunately, we've had the cow slaughter ban. And the cow slaughter ban has resulted in a collapse of many leather sector uh, industries and, 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 and massive loss of jobs. So what we need to focus on is, of course, helping SMEs. And we'll come back to this subject in a minute. But we, in the S support for SMEs, unfortunately, we have a structure of financial and, and, and uh, non-financial uh, benefits given to SMEs which actually discourage growth. So in other words, we've got a sort of repeat of the SSI reservation policy. So in fact, if firms grow beyond being medium sized, they fall off a cliff in terms of incentives. So this, in a sense, which is itself a problem because you can't really compete with a Bangladesh or Vietnam 
in the, in the garments or in other sectors if you know you can't compete on scale which brings your, brings down your your, your cost what's the third the third component <clears throat> well cluster development to support msmes with production link with linkages with larger units you know this is a standard established strategy of late industrialized industrializers uh, it was very successfully followed in in italy in northern italy and then in in china of course um, but india unfortunately has been a laggard we now we know that three fourths of non agri employment is unorganized and it all mostly occurs in 5500 organic clusters which have you know grown over decades across the whole country you know there are modern industry clusters there are handloom handicraft and other traditional uh, product clusters but what is the cluster development program of the government of india well the cluster development programs are mostly located in the msme ministry and in the textiles ministry and but the problem with these cluster development programs one they are poorly funded uh, no more than 1000 crores is allocated in a year for 5500 clusters the second problem is uh, the input services which are provided to them well then there's a need, the, there are a whole series of programs which sort of come in with different types of inputs for different clusters what we need in fact is cluster level integration in respect of the four most important input services, meaning credit technology, skills, and market development. And then finally, there's a sort of pol policy coherence in respect of skills, uh, where there needs to be some coherence established between the district industry centers, which have become defunct, and industry associations uh, at, at the clus cluster level. I mean, the potential is huge. Um, India could induce new clusters along fi the five uh, industry infrastructure corridors also, and we'll come back to that in a minute. What is component number four? Well, these clusters will not grow unless they get better infrastructure. Now, most mid-sized -town towns have pretty poor infrastructure in our country. So what we need to do is align urban infrastructure development with manufacturing, with the location of manufacturing clusters if we want to create jobs. So the Ministry of Urban Development funds this program called Amrut for the last five years. It's supposed to fund about 500 tier two, three, four cities. But, you know, what this can enable is better infrastructure in towns where the clusters are located. But this choice of towns which, are, which uh, get the Amrut program has nothing to do with where the clusters are, which is a, prop, which is a problem. So MOUD is not choosing towns which have clusters. So there's a, some, a certain amount of sort of coordination that's necessary. There are other actions that, that you know, I talk about, which I mean, I, I, I don't have the time to talk about, but it, it's, it's in the paper. You know, it's very important that we focus our infrastructure investments into small and medium sized towns. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a strategy which the Chinese followed with great effect. And perhaps later I can come back to this. Human resources, I don't have to say too much. Well, East Asia, <clears throat> we know, not only invested in education early, but they invested in vocational education and training. And the education and training agenda was designed to underpin industrial policy. Our, stra our tragedy is we neither have an industrial policy, nor, does our, nor do we have a TVET policy which is underpinned, uh, which, which underpins the industrial policy. So what would, what, what am I suggesting? There's need to locate training at the cluster level. You know, why? The first advantage of doing that is that that is where the jobs are. Because currently, well, you, you know, you're locating skill development centers all over the, all over the country where the jobs might not be there. Here, if the training was located right there, then it would be relevant and the jobs would be right there and kids may not have to migrate away. Second advantage, well, the industry is right there. You can ensure industry engagement in skilling, which is essential and it's easier. The third advantage is that the clusters, are, uh, you know, if they are located, if the skill centers are located at the clusters, 
it enhances demand for skilling, especially among girls, because girls will not be sent far from, by their parents, and girls are getting better educated. And what they lack is skills. And we all know what has been happening to the labor force participation rate of women. And so anyway, moving on, the problem with the Skill India program, and this was true even before this government came to power, is that the skills programs of the government are supply driven, they are managed and financed by the government, which leads to mismatches between industry needs and skill priorities and to low placement of the skills. So how do we make these skills programs demand driven? Well, we need to move in the following direction. We need, the government needs to incentivize industry to contribute at the public and private vocational training providers through curriculum design, internship, placement counseling to, to, to serve mid-level functions in, in industry. Um, and also, of course, we need very rapidly to grow the TVET uh, provision in, in the country in order to divert students from general academic education, because students are continuing in general academic education and uh, accumulate degrees and then become un unemployable. Finally, there's a, there's, a, there's a way of actually ensuring greater involvement of private industry uh, through an in reimbursable industry contribution uh, so that employers <clears throat> actually do the training to a much greater extent than they are currently doing. In their, Which in component are you on? Uh... Sabdosh. I'm on, on four, sir. I'm on, well, sorry, I'm on, uh, I've already turned to six. So six, we seven, are, eight. We are already 20 minutes on. Okay, I, let me very quickly finish with this. Let me actually um, speed over this one. I want, let me make uh, just a uh, very briefly point about minerals as a, as a foundation. Because unfortunately, despite the fact that, you know, we have ample resources underground in minerals, and minerals can be a foundation for, in, for industry, India imports minerals more than it exports. This is a big reason for this, is that small size, small size mines dominate industry. The public sector is still contributes a very significant proportion of, of all mining. The rest of the mines are all small in the private sector. And we know that 1% growth in, of, of mining could actually generate rapid industrial output. Unfortunately, despite opening uh, the mining sector up to FDI, it's, it's not happening. The government is short of funds. Domestic invert, uh, investors are shying away. Why? Primarily because the independent mi mining regulatory authority is needed. And there's a real issue about mining regulation, which you know, needs much greater attention because it does not inspire confidence. Um, let me turn finally to my last two slides and I'll finish very quickly, is essentially making the argument that, you know, we cannot have a manufacturing, sustained manufacturing growth in the absence of building design capacity at enterprise level and building and investing in a national innovation system to, to, to all those who are listening to actually have a look at the paper which uh, was distributed by um, ICRIA. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I took longer than I had intended. Thank you, Santosh. I think let's move uh, quickly on to the next speaker, Rajat. Uh, you have the floor now. Dr. Rajat Kathuria. Thank you, Hoda. Thank you, Santosh, for a very nice and cogent presentation. Uh, what I think is absolutely the necessity of the times, given what we are going through, I think thinking about a very strong industrial policy is exactly the right uh, thing that you put on the table. And I would encourage you know, all the scholars, everybody who's present here, including if anybody from the government, to think about an industrial policy, we sorely need that. And I know that the government had begun to talk about an industrial policy, but I think it fell by the wayside and lots of events have happened uh, in the interim to prevent sort of time and mind space to be devoted to an industrial strategy or an industrial policy. But I think it is time to look at an industrial policy for all the reasons that Santosh had mentioned, 
So I'll pick on a few, not to sort of dispute them. There's only one sort of issue that I will put on the table that maybe we could have a discussion on. But the rest, I think there's nothing to disagree with what Santosh had said. And the context really, to my mind, uh, is the fact that, you know, if you look at overall, you know, why do you need an industrial policy? Uh, of course, you know, it has to be compatible with all your industrial and international commitments. But the reason why we need an industrial policy or a policy that intervenes is to sort of address the manifold market failures that India endures. And I think that India sort of has much more sort of market failures than, than other countries. And they are, sort of have much more pervasive uh, and negative and adverse impacts. So address all those market failures. And, uh, and Santosh has talked about them. There's so many market failures. Uh, you know, it could be in skills, it could be in education, it could be in product market, labor market, capital market. So those need to be addressed and channelized in the direction so that once the economy has matured, one can begin to lift some of those interventions or industrial policies that one has designed. Remember that we are not sort of an Anglo-Saxon model. We are much more like the Japanese model or, or Korean or, or the Chinese model where they've had uh, as Santosh was saying, they've had much more intense sort of interventions in the economy and channelizing the allocation of resources in particular directions. Now, that could mean picking winners, and we could discuss that. Uh, I don't know whether Santosh is advocating that, but there are some points that one could make about the labor intensive sectors. But at a broad level, I think that uh, addressing those market failures. Uh, is necessary for us. And, but there is one sort of constraint that keeps coming up. And if you read the, the work of political scientists, I mean, the reason why China and Korea and Japan before us succeeded in industrial policy is because they, were, they had the ability to, to put out those interventions, to put out those policies, but they had the ability to also implement and enforce the policies. And I think where India has often come up short is in terms of the policy package, if you include enforcement as a part of the policy package, then I think India has come up short much more in terms of enforcement uh, than in terms of creating a policy. So I think we have to do a lot of administrative uh, reform, a lot of judicial reform, a lot of uh, administrative reform, if we are able to have a very successful policy along the lines that Santosh has uh, helped us to think about. So I think that, that, that would be my point number one. We need an industrial policy, but we also need a machinery, an administrative and judicial machinery that is able to enforce and implement just in the manner that Japan, Korea, and China were able to do before us. And this, you know, this has been substantiated by the work of a number of political scientists that are enforcement and by economists where our enforcement falls short, although our policies may not fall short, but our enforcement falls short. The second point I'd like to make is about uh, reinforcing something that uh, Santosh has said about picking sort of labor intensive manufacturing to be able to absorb the labor that is going to be released by, by agriculture and absorb the labor that is going to come up, uh, come into the labor force for the first time. And Santosh had a number of 5 million uh, and that, to that you would have to add as a process of structural transformation some of the labor would be released, excess labor would be released from agriculture and would be employed in this more productive manufacturing and you'll have to absorb that labor as well. So the number will probably be more and I think it's absolutely critical, especially at this point when India is going through sort of terrible you know, unemployment because of the pandemic and one doesn't know whether we'll be able to recreate that employment and, and what manner we'll be able to provide you know, jobs to the people who've been uh, rendered unemployment, but manufacturing is clearly a way forward. And as Santosh said, labor intensive manufacturing, they, the, the sort of problem of the weaknesses of the Indian economy have been that, you know, you've had labor intensive manufacturing, but it's been more capital intensive than before. And there's a lot of work, including by ICRIA, that demonstrates that. And as Santosh said, some of these you know, outputs haven't been uh, able to grow because of the laws prevented them to grow. So the firm size dynamics has 
encourage them to remain small. And we know that scale is extremely important if you've got to cater to the, the, the mass of, of people that are going to be coming into the labor force for labor intensive manufacturing, you'll need to have large scale. And large scale will encourage the small and medium enterprises also uh, to be able to become you know, suppliers to them in some sort of linkages between the large firms and the small firms. So the there's nothing bad about being large. Large firms allow small and medium enterprises to grow. And you can think of the automobile industry as an example where small and big has coexisted side by side. And we've been able to also use that uh, as a strategy for exporting. So labor intensive manufacturing, especially in those sectors which have the ability to, to absorb more labor, and you know, get rid of all the disincentives of growing. And reform labor laws, and I'd like to make this point because this point has been made you know, in the context of the recent debate as well. When you reform labor laws, you're not taking away the power of labor and you're not, you, you're not taking away the, 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 the sort of social protection that you're giving uh, to workers. So you need to make reform in labor laws, but you also need to ensure that labor gets the minimum protection that is necessary. So not at the expense of protection, but with protection. I think where India has really failed is that you know, there's been a lot of rent seeking that has happened as a result of the labor laws. And that's what I meant in the beginning when I said, you know, administrative reform is necessary, you know, enforcement is necessary, good quality enforcement. And I think that has to do with labor laws as well. So refine the labor laws, make it easier, but do not, you know, sacrifice uh, the, the benefits that you are going to give workers. And that's going to be absolutely uh, essential in our development, in our structural transformation. We cannot do without manufacturing. We cannot you know, leapfrog manufacturing and go into services because services, as, as Santosh has said in his paper as well, the services that you are able to get after you have a robust and strong manufacturing sector are very different from the kind of services that you get when you leapfrog the manufacturing sector or bypass uh, the manufacturing sector. So you'll get low end services, you'll get informal services that we've got in India. And people, as we say in India, can't afford to be unemployed. So they, they, they do anything uh, to be able to make to ends meet. So those are the kind of services that sort of could be sort of done away with, could be sacrificed in, in favor of high end services, which could then become uh, possible uh, on the back of a very strong and robust manufacturing sector. The third point uh, I want to make is that the interlinkage between trade and industrial policy is absolutely paramount. And, and as I've been saying uh, in, in many, various other platforms as well, I think we had very hard earned gains uh, a post 1991 we reduced tariffs. We were able to begin to become, you know, export competitive. We were able to export to countries that we never dreamed of in the 70s and 80s. And one of the reasons we were able to do that was because we sort of reduced tariffs, we allowed imports to come in, and those became a part of the value chain. Uh, and we were able to use efficient imports to be able to then add value and exports uh, and export. And I think that has to remain a part of our strategy, even in the current context. Yes, we can use tariffs, at least tweak tariffs a little bit uh, to be able to uh, sort of make in India or produce in India. But I don't think tariffs should be an integral part of our industrial policy uh, to be able to incentivize domestic manufacturing. And I must belabor this point because, uh, as I said earlier, that our, we were able to export because we were able to import. Import substitution and export promotion cannot go hand in hand. And it's a lesson that we learned, that we learned the very hard way uh, you know, before 1991. So I would say that if we are going to encourage domestic manufacturing, look at, you know, instruments other than tariffs. Tariffs could be a part of a package, but it should not be uh, sort of a permanent uh, part of an industrial policy and trade and industrial policy package, because to be able to become globally competitive and to become a part of global value chains, uh, that I don't think, you know, having import tariffs would be a terribly good idea. And while I'm talking about this, I think also to say that if India dreams of becoming a part of global value chains, and we are you know, thinking about this, especially in the context of the current pandemic, uh, as China 
you know, pushes out and other countries also pull out of China uh, for various reasons, including higher wages, including the geopolitical situation. And as uh, India tries to sort of invite those companies to locate in India, you know, we'll have to make global value chains much more efficient in India. We'll have to make them much more resilient. And resiliency is going to be a part of the global value chain phenomena or the re regional value chain phenomena as we go forward, because you know, companies and countries are recognizing that if you rely only on one source uh, for your input uh, supply or your component supply, that could be held at risk. So how do you make your value chains much more uh, resilient? And I don't think domestication of value chains is a good idea because you'll have you'll you know sacrifice economies of scale and you'll increase the risk also, you'll concentrate the risk. So I think diversification of global value chains is, is a good idea, but diversification is a strategy which is best met by having sort of moderate tariffs and not using tariffs uh, as a part of the strategy. And you know, as Santosh said, there are other instruments, including sort of regulatory forbearance, reducing regulatory burdens, and also you know, the exchange rate that could form a part of our trade and industrial policy mix. But I think it's absolutely critical for us that we become globally competitive, that we begin to export, because if you don't export, you're not going to be able to become competitive. And then we'll go back to the days of the automobile industry that everybody loves to talk about the 70s and 80s. You had you know, products, you had you know, bad quality products, but then you had a market in India that you could sell to. You don't want to go back to that sort of regime. Of course, that's an extreme, but I'm just posing that as, as, as a counterpoint. The third point, and probably the second last point that I, I, as I wish to make is as, as, as uh, uh, Santosh had said, you know, it's absolutely important to get regulation right. And, and uh, you know, as we trans transition in India from rural to urban, as we transition in India from socialism to, you know, adopting much more market-friendly strategies, we need to be able to have efficient regulation. And regulation should not become an excuse for over-regulation, just the right balance of regulation. And this is where, where I think we haven't done uh, extremely well. The regulators that we've created, the regulations that we've done, often tend to become overly regulated, and that you know burdens industry a lot. Let me give you one example, and this is cited in, in Santosh's paper as well. And, and he talks about industrial policy and regulation together, where you, know, you channelize resources effectively, so you avoid duplication of investment. And I think telecom sector in India, where I worked on extensively, is an example where we've, of course, grown and you know, market entry was allowed, private sector did wonders for, for uh, telecom sector. But one of the things that we haven't done well is not being able to prevent the overinvestment that has happened in your infrastructure. And therefore, you know, all those problems associated with getting right of way and not being able to create a backbone, which is called the Bharat Net program, which has been languishing for many, many years. And I think every operator, you know, created a separate infrastructure for itself. And this infrastructure-based competition happened uh, because, you know, there was lack of trust. They, the operators didn't think they would be able to use uh, infrastructure or share infrastructure which was built by somebody else. And there's a, sort of a lot of literature on this, but this limiting it to the point that Santosh made, if we had a cogent industrial policy, then we could have done, you know, a resource scarce country could have done without overinvesting uh, in telecommunication infrastructure. And therefore you need, you know, strong regulations and strong administrative capacity to be able to, to do that. And this is an example where you could, so you could have other ex examples from other sectors as well. And the last point I wish to make, uh, again, is something that, uh, I want to underline what Santosh has said about you know, creating a strategy of innovation and R&D. We know from the literature on economics through Solo uh, and, and through you know, the other you know, econ eminent economists that the only way to sort of consistently grow and not be subject to diminishing returns is to have innovation. Uh, and we are not in the same you know, league as, as as United States and China right now on our innovation strategies, but fundamentally, you know, if we have to sustain growth rates, 
uh, and make those growth rates sustainable and inclusive, I think innovation will have to be a part of the mix. And this is where the public sector will have to play a greater role because private sector often eschews investing where they don't see immediate returns. I think government will have to play uh, a, a primary role in encouraging R&D, which can then have spillover benefits to the private sector and public sector uh, also. But R&D is something which is going to be fundamental uh, to our growth strategies of the future, both for sustainability as well as for inclusion. So that's all I wanted to say in the beginning. I'm happy to come back, but congratulations, Santosh, and we're very happy to have had uh, your presentation in this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rajat. Uh, let me move quickly on and request Ajay uh, <clears throat> Shankar, former secretary of DIPP, industry secretary, in other words. Uh, please take the floor now. Yeah. Ajay. Uh, I, I, I begin by appreciating the fact that Equir is organizing this uh, discussion on a very important subject. A subject which doesn't get the attention it deserved, in my view. Uh, to begin with, uh, a set of facts which are not in the consciousness of a younger generation. And which is that in 1991, the per capita income of India and China were at par. And in terms of technology, we were similar also. I mean, some would claim we were ahead in some areas, others would claim they were ahead. But nobody in 91 felt that they were far ahead. Uh, today, we've reached a stage that they are the factory of the world and uh, we are nowhere in that league. So that's the hard reality. And we need to try and understand why this gap. And we need to try and then figure out what we can do to bridge the gap today. Because obviously, we can't go back in time. Uh, Santosh in his presentation referred to uh, some of the major factors and the key factors. And he did a outstanding job. I would pick up just two broad areas to, to try and understand and highlight uh, where we have moved and why we have not succeeded in manufacturing. The first one was which uh, Santosh referred to and said he'd leave it to other speakers to dwell upon. And that is the real exchange rate. Now, uh, the, the political elite as well as the other elite in India there is still the perception that a strong currency is a sign of a strong economy. A net result is that, say, between 2009 to 2017, the real exchange rate of India went up by 19%. Uh, this is equivalent to lowering of tariffs by 19%, which in some cases would mean that we had effectively negative import duties. Now, the political economy behind a strong exchange rate is one which favors the consumer over the producer and it favors the big versus the small. And it is also a mistake to believe that the exchange rate matters only for exports. It is as important for the domestic market because we have now an open liberal market economy. So an appreciated exchange rate makes imports from China cheaper, they displace domestic manufacturing. And wherever domestic value addition is say over 30%, where it should be, the movement of the exchange rate upwards is really crippling. Now, if you look at the successes of East Asia, each one followed a policy of keeping the exchange rate artificially low. When they succeeded in industrialization, the West and the Americans came down on them heavily, and then they did some course correction moderately. Now, I am not arguing for an artificial depreciation of the rupee, but we certainly need to see that we don't allow the exchange rate to appreciate in real terms. Because if we do that, we destroy or weaken the business case for value addition. So I think we need a greater discussion on this and a consensus that the RBI should have as a policy goal, the maintenance of the real exchange rate. Now, in India is unique where the real exchange rate goes up, unlike in other countries, because we get a huge capital inflows through remittances, which most other countries don't get. So even though our exports are modest, we still have an appreciating real exchange rate. 
So, so I would again labor the point that we must get a consensus that we will not allow the real exchange rate to appreciate and allow the present depreciation. Now, the next point, which is again critical as to why we are where we are, is that we have been focusing in the last few years on the ease of doing business, which is important. But what really matters is the cost of doing business. And the cost of doing business is not an issue which is discussed. We haven't evolved parameters to track progress. Now, if you look at the, the actual factors which go into industry or manufacturing, then each of the key factors we have consciously or unconsciously reached a situation where the costs do not make it attractive to invest in manufacturing. And let us begin with land where infrastructure is reasonable, say in the NCR, et cetera, land prices are far too high. Where land is cheaply available, there is no infrastructure. The state has retreated and is not developing industrial estates with world-class infrastructure and allotting land at reasonable rates. If we look at the quality of infrastructure, it is weak. The costs are high. So the industrial tariffs in India are amongst the highest in the world in real terms. We are the only country where industry pays the highest and uh, household consumers pay the least. Both in China and US, the industry has always paid the least. Move forward to logistic costs. Now, for a variety of reasons, we felt compelled to go for toll highways. But the net result is that the toll logistic cost is far higher in India than in our competitors. Then we tax petrol and diesel in a prohibitive manner. There is no discussion of bringing them under GST. So we tax them so much that they are really far more expensive than they should be. And who bears that cost? It is business which bears that cost. Coming to labor, I'm glad Santosh highlighted the, the problem of the vocational training area. Because the fact is you may have the same machine with the same productivity in India and in Vietnam. But if in India your labor comes in after struggling for one hour to the workplace and struggling for his morning toilet and so on and so forth, he needs a cup of tea to get away. There is no way he'll be as productive on that machine as the counterpart in Vietnam who has walked in fit after a good night's rest. 100 years back in our textile industry, which is globally competitive, we had workers' accommodation next to the place of work. In the last 30 years, we have not been attempting to create workers' accommodation near the place of work. No industrial estate, Noida, Burgaon, Manisar has done this as a matter of conscious policy. So, so factor after factor, we have been not paying attention to the basic and simple things, and these can easily be set right. Well, they're not impossible to do. You can create a new power plant, which is and give the power exclusively to the industrial power cheap. You can give old LTC power. The state can invest money and create an industrial park and begin with lease land at his rates. As Santosh said, you can even at state cost train workers and create workers' housing, which is rental in these industrial parks. So that's the way we have to go forward. The other major area is the regulatory costs. Now, the regulatory costs in India are high, and notwithstanding the improvement in rankings on these of doing business, these are high, there are rent seeking costs. And there are regulatory risks and uncertainties. So, so unless we recognize this as a problem and try to settle it, and again measure progress through some quantifiable parameters, we would again not be creating the right uh, climate for industrial investment and growth in manufacturing. Uh, a word on industrial policy. Now, pre-91, we tried to micromanage a bit too much, and this was counterproductive. So there's been an understandable reluctance to use the word industrial policy and act upon it in some real terms, in a real basis. There is also the feeling that we can't pick winners and losers. Now there's a conceptual mistake or a flaw in this reasoning, because the idea that government or state should not be trying to pick winners and losers emerged in under advanced industrial economies, primarily UK, and where there were a couple of very expensive state-supported failures, the most notable being the Concorde supersonic 
intercontinental air time. But for a developing country like India, we are not today wanting to create global winners in a frontier technology area. We want to catch up in mature technologies and create jobs. So that industrial policy is very distinct from the way industrial policy were understood in the developed world at one time. And Santosh is right, I focus in industrial policy should be in labor intensive manufacturing. We have lost a lot of time. The window on labor intensive manufacturing is closing across the world due to technology. But whatever time remains, we need to focus hard and get that manufacturing going in India as soon as possible because this failure in doing so has led to greater inequalities, social unrest, and the potential for social unrest going forward is far higher. Now, in order to succeed in labor intensive manufacturing, I think the point made by Rajat as well as Santosh was right, that we have to think not through the, the prism of import duties. We have to think it through in partnership with business and in with, with uh, you know, smart minds and better understanding of how this labor intensive manufacturing is happening in the world and what strengthens the business case for it. So if import duties are required for a short period of time, by sure, please do so. But clearly it is in nobody's case that we go back to the import duties of the 80s and 70s and protect an industry at a lower level of efficiency and quality. So a well thought through game plan for each sector as to how starting today we will be globally competitive and have a significant share of global manufacturing and what policy instruments will get us there is what is required rather than an episodic imposition of safeguard duty as we've done in solar panels or in raising of import duties. So I, I will pick up an area which has not been mentioned by Santosh, but let us take shipbuilding. Shipbuilding is labor intensive and remain labor intensive for a long time to come. We have no game plan on how to get shipbuilding into India. Wages in China have risen sufficiently that industry is ready to move out. But we need to figure out how to get it here. So do we create a shipbuilding SEZ? Do we say that uh, Indian cargo will move on Indian made ships starting 24, 25, even if the cost is a bit higher for uh, you know, imports of fertilizers or coal or whatever. So we have to think it through and that is something which we have not yet done systematically in any key set. So, so I would argue that in, instead of looking at an industrial policy, across the board and becoming self-reliant in everything. We focus on reducing costs, both real costs as well as regulatory costs. We focus on creating world-class infrastructure. We pick up a few labor intensive areas, some in high technology, shipbuilding, electronic hardware, some in conventional areas like uh, garments, etc. toys for that matter, because toys is a combination of uh, electronics today and traditional garment kind of work. And we see how within five years, we set some realistic goal of global market share. And to begin with in something like toys, domestic market share, 85% of the market is with imports. And then keep fine tuning our policy instruments to see that we actually succeed. And if we do not do that, uh, this whole prime minister's vision of self-reliant India, et cetera, like the earlier slogan of Make in India, would remain an aspiration because the, the policy instruments of converting it into reality would not have been put in place. And one final word, and which is that we should look at the state stepping into the SEZ space, creating large SEZs, and changing the policy framework to allow sales into the domestic uh, tariff area as being enough to fulfill the export obligations of the SEZ and the import duty on sales to the domestic tariff area should be the lowest one prevailing with our any trading partner. So when garments the lowest is with Bangladesh or in some FTAs it is with Thailand, manufacturing from the SEZ should come into India on the sort of same import duties. So at least in the SEZ to begin with you can create a level playing field while we struggle to do so in other parts of the world. I would end again with the appeal that we must give this the highest priority in manufacturing and industry. 
We have neglected it for tall, far too long, and our development aspirations will be met only if we begin succeeding. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Let me uh, go on to give my own remarks. Uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. I'll cut out all the introductory uh, remarks that I had proposed to make, and I go straight to the subject. The three points uh, on which uh, the industrial strategy uh, must deal uh, uh, are uh, land, labor, and logistics, the three L's. The first requirement that we have uh, for industries to develop is to provide units, entrepreneurs, with develop, developed land so that they can come in and set up straight away. In 2011, the government announced the National Manufacturing Policy. A, good com a, a big component of that policy was the idea of setting up national manufacturing zones. Then separately, the idea emerged of industrial corridors. And the first one we thought of, they thought of was the Delhi-Mumbai industrial corridor. But things don't seem to have progressed enough. Recently, uh, you all must have read something in the Bloomberg report that government was thinking in terms of, or had identified already an area equal to uh, Luxembourg for setting up industries. Now this fired our imagination once again. Let us hope that something happened. A PM has invited foreign companies to come and make in India. This can happen only if we provide land and develop land to the manufacturing companies. Not free, but as a reasonable rate, but free of hassle. India is competing with other host countries for the inflow of foreign investment into manufacturing. If we ask the foreign manufacturing companies to go through the land acquisition procedures, such as what we have, they would rather run away. The land acquisition laws that were passed in 2013 have put a number of hurdles, social impact assessment, consent of 70 to 80% of the landholders over and above the environmental clearance, then compensation at four times the market price for rural land and so on. The high cost hurdle is something that both the foreign investors and the domestic investors may eventually overcome, but the procedural impediments leave them with no enthusiasm. Fortunately, uh, I think four or five states have brought about changes in their laws and got rid of uh, this uh, landholders' consent and the social impact assessment for the industrial corridors. Now, if we want manufacturing to grow in India, there is no alternative to providing, government providing developed land and making these lands available to investors in manufacturing, not only foreign investors, but domestic investors also, at a price, of course. In this context, uh, some people have raised the question that if so much land is given for manufacturing, will it not uh, affect uh, uh, the uh, uh, food security? Now, uh, some safeguards have been put in the land acquisition laws uh, for this. Let, uh, I don't have time to go into it, but let me say that the truth is that non-agricultural uses of land, including industrial uses, have not put much pressure on agriculture so far. But let me say that the future might be different. A recent 
report by the World Bank has brought out that if the urban sprawl goes on developing as it has been in the last 10 years or so, then much of the crop land might be lost to this messy urbanization. They have, uh, they have estimated that by 2050, that is 30 years from today, the <clears throat> as much as 10% of the uh, agricultural land will be lost to messy urbanization. What they have said is that you better plan it out and therefore industrialization uh, will be part of the solution, not a part of the problem. Now, that was land, labor. Like many others, I have been critical of certain features of the Indian labor laws, which impart rigidity. These are aspects which investors in manufacturing enterprises criticize. Government today seems to be aiming at uh, a slow change, a process of slow change. However, I have been taken aback by the startling initiative taken over a fortnight back in, in Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh has promulgated an ordinance exempting factories and some other establishments for three years from many of the important labor laws. The ostensible justification is the coronavirus. Many of us like the labor laws to move towards flexibility, but we should not move to the other extreme of chaos. We should not ignore the norms stipulated in international labor laws, uh, international labor convention, and followed by many other countries. Temporary changes in labor laws, such as what UP has brought about, will not be very uh, inviting for uh, uh, investors in industry. What industry or investors or entrepreneurs care most for is a stable environment. Let me just pick out three or four uh, uh, notable features of Indian labor laws, which uh, are not at all <clears throat> conducive to industries. You must have all heard, and we haven't heard anyone else speaking today, although they have been quite comprehensive, other speakers. India has created a world of its own in the law and practice relating to industrial relations. It requires factories, mines, and plantations, which employ more than 100 workers, to take prior permission of government for retrenchment and layoff. This introduces rigidity in industrial relations. It drives down firm size and productivity and restricts creation of decent jobs. Why is it that China, as an economy of scale, with some clothing companies having a workforce of 30,000? In, even in Bangladesh, individual companies have sometimes garment, uh, 10,000 garment workers. In India, the largest units have a maximum of 1,000 hands. What makes our laws in this respect arbitrary is <clears throat> norms have not been fixed for taking the decision if someone uh, needs a permission. Granting of permission for retrenchment or layoff is almost entirely a matter of discretion by the authority concerned. The second 
aspect of labor laws that I would like to point out is <clears throat> is mandatory payment of time at double the rate. Now, nowhere in the world double the rate of overtime payment is prescribed. It is one of the factors that prevents Indian manufacturing from becoming internationally competitive. Payment of bonus act is another feature of India's labor laws. It requires mandatory payment of bonus even when there is no profit. Now, to require companies and other employers to grant bonus to employees even when there are profits, even when there are profits, is itself a departure from the principle of market economy. And to have a law that requires them to pay bonus even when there are no profits. Now, uh, certainly that vitiates the, in, uh, the in investment for, uh, the, the uh, environment for investment in the country. Now, logistics, my third point. This is perhaps the most important. I think other speakers uh, have already referred to the importance of logistics. I don't, don't have to speak at length to convey to the audience that it is long past the time when manufacturers took place in a, on a single factory floor. Nowadays, manufacturing industries uh, <clears throat> involve movement of parts and components from long distances. The phenomenon of international production sharing or international production networks has been uh, growing in evidence in the last 20, 30 years. So if we want manufacturing to be competitive, we have to provide for competitive logistics costs. And the finished parts, finished products these days, are no longer merely the sum of physical parts. Increasingly, they incorporate and embody services, design, and other intangibles, including intellectual property rights. In this situation, when parts and components have to move long distances, logistics cost plays a big role in determining manufacturing competitiveness. Transport infrastructure, particularly at the gateways, has to be world-class. The telecommunications infrastructure and services are also important. Investors will move in and set up manufacturing units only if they assess that the logistics cost is competitive as compared to other investment destinations. While a lot of work is going on, there remain significant deficiencies in the transport infrastructure in the country even now. Our roads are not world-class. Our railways are not reliable in delivering consignments on time. And our ports have insufficient support infrastructure. Now, there is a, a list of action plan which will have uh, immediate effect. What we would recommend is to build an expressway on the Western Economic Corridor and also complete the Western dedicated freight corridor quickly and also give attention to insufficient support infrastructure in the ports. 70% of the movement of containers takes place on the Western corridor. And these actions will make immediate difference in lowering the logistic costs. Let me conclude quickly by saying that the strategy that we need to boost manufacturing must include dealing effectively with issues in three areas, land, labor, and logistics. And I have drawn attention to some of these issues. 
Thank you very much. And that brings to uh, an end the the uh, interventions of the panelists, and I throw open the floor to the participants. The floor is open. Who would like to ask a question or make an observation? If I, if I may read out some questions that I've received for uh, Santosh. Yeah, please. Yeah. Santosh, there are a couple of questions. There's one from Ashutosh Kumar from the Competition Commission. He asks, as per the NSS Employment Survey, share of formal workers in the workforce decreased from 1993 94 to 2011-12. However, the PLFS survey shows an increase in formalized employment. Could you comment on that? Uh, and there are a couple of other questions from uh, which deal with manufacturing in China. Can we you know, create an end-to-end -end manufacturing system as we've done in China? And what should be the balance between domestic manufacturing and manufacturing for exports and our engagement with global value chains. Uh, Rajat, I didn't hear your, the, que the question about uh, employment from 1993 to 2012 and then PLFS. Could you repeat that? Or, I, or maybe yes. I didn't understand the question. Please repeat. The, the question uh, that has come to me is, uh, why has the, what do you say about the share of formal workers formal. was decreased between 93-94 and 2011-12? However, share of formal workers increased in the recent PLFS survey. What is the reason? What is the reason behind this? So, uh, two points, very quickly. Um, the share of formal workers uh, has improved between 2012 and 2018. Very, very little. It has improved, but it has not improved radically. So. If 93% of the workforce in the economy was informal uh, in 2012, that number is down to 20, 91%. That's, I mean, that's neither here nor there, honestly. First of all, point two. What is the reason for that two percentage point decline? Uh, it's essentially twofold. One is the, the GST, which resulted in... A, uh, a certain number of largish informal enterprises registering in the in the GST, and when they registered in the GST, they also uh, uh, registered themselves with the EPFO, so they got captured there. This, please try and understand that this is not new jobs; these are simply uh, some companies which were which were perhaps, you know, employing more than 20 workers earlier, but, you know, uh, they would declare only 19, and now they've made, they've declared them, and they sort of suddenly show up uh, uh, as, 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 as formal because they register in the GST as well as the ESO. So the second reason was the, um, the, the scheme that uh, the government announced, the Pradhan Mantri, uh, M M M R Y, I think it's called. I can't remember the full name. It's a Protsahan Yojana, uh, for whereby the government, in, you know, promises to pay for three years the costs of registering new workers under the EPFO. So this led to some firms actually, uh, when they took on new workers, uh, they. Yeah. Or registered them in the EPFO. But honestly, this is not a dramatic change. 93 coming down to 91 is honestly nothing to write home about. If anything, uh, in an economy which is now, currently, post-pandemic, facing 122 million people unemployed, which is a tripling from the erstwhile rate in a matter of weeks, in an economy where the vast majority, 91% of our workforce is informal, this is nothing short of a catastrophe for the working people of our country. Uh, 
Rajat, did you have any more questions? I, I, there are questions uh, relating to the current economic package. Can you hear me, Santosh? And uh, I can. I uh, perhaps I I've already spoken too much. I think uh, the others could handle that. There, there, there are also questions on any of the you know uh, Professor Hoda, Ajay, uh, Shankarji. If you could respond, uh, there are questions on the current economic package. Will that provide an incentive to boost manufacturing in India? That seems to be uh, the current sort of wave of questions coming in. And how can we emulate China? What would what would it take for us to become the factory of the world, as you had said? Um, what would can we ever become that? And will the pandemic provide an in, or does the economic package provide an incentive to do that? Uh, I would um, be tempted to answer the question in the following way: that we have to think big. Uh, create large manufacturing zones, create large, uh, you know, workers' housing, train workers on scale, then do what it takes to get investment to come in that area and in that sector, and create the ecosystem where investors are comfortable having thousands of employees in one area and in one factory. Well, the fact of the matter is that for whatever reasons, the ecosystem is one that no investor wants to have a plant which employs 50, 60,000 workers in one area. Now, now, unless government, some state government can do hand holding with some investors and make this a demonstrable success in a few years, we will not get the rush in for the large scale investments. Now, the fact is that China, I mean, the, the uh, Foxconn, who do all the job work for uh, Apple built a factory on the outskirts of Shanghai, one mile by one mile, 90,000 workers staying in a dormitory in making the iPhones and the iPads. Now, so till we can create confidence in investors, Indian or foreign or joint venture, that you come here, put up a plant of 20, 30, 40, 50, 80,000 workers, make toys or whatever, or ships, and we will hold your hand and we will see that you succeed. We work together to train the workers, feed them well, keep them well, pay them well and create confidence that this is the way to go forward. So, so now that is something we have not seriously attempted. I mean, I have to be honest to accept that I can't recall of a single case of proper handholding where we have tried to get labor intensive manufacturing. We do all the handholding for capital intensive manufacturing. So we get all these state government investment mailers with promises of thousands or hundreds of thousands of crores at this point. But we don't get those mailers saying that we will create 50,000 jobs in the next year or 100,000 jobs in the year after that. So there's a whole change of mindset required. But we get down to it, there's no reason why we can't do it. I mean, we've done it in the past. I mean, I'm, I keep repeating that 100 years back, we had a globally competitive textile industry. 90,000 workers would go the morning long on the streets of Kanpur to the textile mills. Same would have been the story in Calcutta and Ahmedabad and Bombay. So there's no reason we can't repeat it. And the IT industry in India employs hundreds of thousands of they all work well. We don't call them workers, they're IT professionals, but the fact is it's a similar phenomenon they stay on campus. If I could add to that uh, on the same lines, uh, we have been uh, thinking that uh, maybe the time is not very far when investors will move from China and they have to move to us because they can't put all the eggs in one basket. But if that has not been happening, you know, even the trade war has been going on with uh, between China and the USA, but still they haven't moved to India. They have moved, but they have moved to Vietnam, even to Bangladesh, but not to India. And the one reason for that are the weaknesses in the land and labor laws and logistics. These three, which I have sort of I think I would agree completely with Ajay that what we need is large chunks of developed land being made available to the, indu the manufacturing industries. Plug and play, they call it in China. Unless you have that type of a situation, people will not, the uh, entrepreneurs will not move uh, from uh, places like China to India. 
in fact we should not be depending only on foreign investment for development of industries manufacturing industries especially in the labor intensive uh, area in uh, garments or in uh, uh, footwear there is tremendous scope for uh, the uh, expansion of industry and we i don't think we really need foreign investors there all all we have to do is to make the environment and hospitable for the domestic investors the environment in the labor area and i pointed out three or four huge sort of uh, the uh, impediments in labor area unless we provide that entrepreneurs will not move and make new investment not only the foreign investors but the domestic investors too so we have to make large chunks of land available developed land we can't uh, tell them that look there is the land acquisition procedures you go in for that no i think they too much of a problem we heard uh, uh, what happened we know what happened to uh, the korean uh, steel company when they tried to set up something in odisha despite the prime minister's office backing them they could not get what they wanted they could not get the land and there was so much of opposition to their coming in that they just left without establishing so you have to have as you have to bring about a situation you want industries manufacturing industries to develop you have to provide developed land to manufacturers manufacturers who are willing to develop both domestic and foreign investors thank you and and i would like to add one more point i'd like to add one more point that economies of scale are terribly important so if you want something which is globally competitive you have to have scale and that is where china succeeded and we have not yet had the ambition to go in for scale of that kind and i think we need to have that ambition now and i i just want to sort of reemphasize the point that uh, ajay shankar just made about scale and this has something to do with 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 labor law it is not labor law is not the only constraint there are other constraints as well which i think i hinted at which is that we have created this <laughs> overhang from the ssi era of the reservation of product but there's no question the labor law is, a, is 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 a problem so for instance if you look at the data in respect of that particular law the industrial disputes act chapter 5 that 100 100 workers um threshold where firms if they want to fire they need to go to the state government if if uh, uh, if you have more than 100 workers then you if you want to fire workers then you have to go to state government approval and so on now it's interesting that you look at the data of the size distribution of indian enterprises in the organized sector and what is interesting is that the following jumps out at you that there is a high concentration of firms uh well below 100 and then a slight increase in the concentration of uh, all firms close to 100 but the moment you go you know the, if the firm size goes over 100 the number of enterprises drops dramatically and the share of workers in all in the in in all work, in all enterprises uh, which employ more than 100 workers drops dramatically so that 100 threshold is a problem having said that i should say i should add the following that there are other problems with the labor laws also one there are too many of them historically there are there have been 45 central government laws alone 10 of them were repealed by this government there were 35 left over the 35 have now been converged into four codes but unfortunately most of these laws are from the 20th century 
where we've entered the third decade of the 21st century. The economy is diversified. It's grown much bigger. We need new kinds of laws. And all that the four codes have done, managed to do, unfortunately, and one of them has already been passed by parliament, and three, are, three, three may very well be hurriedly passed, are scissor and paste jobs. If you examine those laws carefully, honestly, they are scissor and paste jobs. That means old laws are simply being put together and we are going to be, this is a serious problem. We are going to create more problems for industry. And, and, and uh, so, so the, we, we were trying to solve the problem, but I'm not so sure if we are actually go, going to succeed in solving the problem. Because for instance, one of the problems has been historically with labor law and, and size of, of firms is that each time you add more workers, you become, uh, you have to comply with more labor law. Now that number may have dropped to four, but if you know th the kinds of laws that you, <laughs> that become applicable to you or law that becomes applicable to you is still not very conducive to your growth and size, then the problem is not solved. Now, having said all this, I should add something. You know, we make a big deal about labor law, and I have actually honestly no problems with uh, any of the main points that uh, Mr. Hoda made about land and labor and logistics. But when you ask industry, it's interesting that World Bank Enterprise Survey tells us the following. When you ask the employers, what are the biggest constraints? And you ask them to rank those constraints. Guess where labor law comes in the ranking? After electricity, which is the biggest constraint, after corruption, and after tax administration. So what, what is the meaning of this? It is not that labor law is not a constraint, but they have learned to get around it. They have adapted their behavior over a 30 or 40 year period to get around it. That doesn't mean it doesn't constrain them. So, so we've got a problem. We've got to fix the labor law, no question about it. But we have many other bigger problems which we need to resolve. One you know, point about um, why wouldn't, and I agree entirely with Hoda Saab that, you know, um, that, that MNCs are a bit unlikely, and most of the other speakers, Rajat also said, well, most of the MNCs are unlikely when they're moving out of China, if they're moving out of China at all. Uh, unlikely to come, come to India for all the variety of reasons. And one factor which we haven't mentioned, which I mentioned in passing, and I think need, we need to keep this in mind, that, I mean, they would prefer to go to Vietnam. Why? Because Vietnam has a far better educated workforce and they have a far better skilled workforce. Because like other East, Southeast Asian countries, in, in, uh, Vietnam has a has had an education and skills policy which is an al aligned to the industrial policy. We don't have an education and skills policy which is aligned to a, in, in, in industrial policy. Let me make just two very quick uh, uh, other points um, which, are, which, which, which uh, 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 relate to what Rajat was, was sort of raising. He, he pointed this out. Uh, was I arguing in favor, favor of picking winners? No, Rajat, of course not. And you guessed right. You didn't imply that I was arguing that I was making a case, as you as you recall, for a cross-sectoral industrial policy. Of course, I went on to say there are cross, there are sectoral industrial policies which are required as well. But my whole argument was about a cross-sectoral, not about uh, picking uh, winners at, at, at all. Let me stop there. Uh, I would uh, nuance what Sutosh has said and repeat what I'd said earlier. I think we should not hesitate in saying that we want labor intensive identified industries to succeed and we will have an industrial policy for shipping, for toys and so on and so forth. I think this is perfectly in keeping with the other wisdom that we don't try to look at frontier technology areas and waste a lot of money in creating a million. The, the other point which is uh, again worth considering, is that there is a geopolitical move within the US to get something going out of China. So if we were to develop, say, two, 3,000 acres of land and go to the Walmarts and other large retailers in the US and say, please bring your 
vendors or suppliers who are in China to put up a plant here. We will do the hand holding. We will do all the logistics. We will be willing to even give them land on lease. We can make it an SEZ from which you sell in India, sell to China. I think we have a chance of succeeding today, but it would need a very different kind of hand holded and holding and partnership and investment promotion, where we are specifically talking to a Walmart or a you know, JC Penny or whatever and negotiating specifics that, okay, you bring this to India, bring this vendor here. We will give him these incentives for these number of years. We can give him free land. We can even give him rented land and brick machines, but bring him here and, and scale is the key. Because, because in most of our sectors, we do not have anybody who can take an order for one season in garments for even one product. Because we don't have the volumes, we should make sure that every retail outfit has that product. Right. But it can be done in six months to a year. Right. I mean, after all, we train soldiers who are world class in six months to a year. There's no reason we, why we can't train workers of that kind in six months to a year. So I don't think it's something that needs to wait for years. I have just one point in response to what Santosh said about the labor laws. He made the point that the uh, Indian uh, industry has learned to live with the labor laws. Now, well, they may have learned to live with it, but at what cost? By, I agree. Uh, by going away from an economy of scale. I agree. By having this, that's exactly what you said, Santosh. That uh, you have uh, that the industry has gone round. You also uh, referred to uh, the missing middle. The, the middle is missing completely because of the labor loss. And economy of scale is missing also because of the labor loss. If you uh, agree, I agree. Chapter 5B of the Industrial Disputes Act is what has to uh, be amended in order to have economy of scale. You can't have economy of scale if you have people, uh, if you have a provision in law that if you want to uh, uh, retrench or uh, uh, make a downward adjustment in the labor force, then you have to go to government to seek permission. And what is worse, the laws do not prescribe the norms on which the permission will be given. It is in, this is the point I made earlier that it is left entirely to the discretion of the authority which is taking decision to say yes or no. You're right. I, I just want to add something to, to, uh, to yes. reinforce what you're saying. In fact, what work what employers have actually done is that they don't declare the workers or they do contract workers, and that's the one way of actually having more work more workers than hundred but they just don't declare them. That's one reason why the inform informality. But uh, you know that 5B is actually can be easily addressed. There is actually agreement between, uh, among most of the trade unions on the one hand and the industry on the other, employers on the other, that you know, instead of what Cha Industrial uh, Disputes Act Chapter 5B is saying that we will give you, if you are dismissed, we will give you only two weeks uh, pay for each year of work, there should be a payment of six weeks pay for each year of work. There's actual agreement between them. If only this was the amendment that was made, if this amendment was made, then you know that, that uh, threshold that, uh, of 100 can, can actually be done away with in this, this uh, uh, sore which has been festering uh, with both employers and, em and employees uh, will, can disappear. Well, we have been thinking, uh, those of us who have been uh, 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 looking at this subject, that eventually there may be a grand bargain uh, whereby this Chapter 5B will go and there will be agreement on uh, a higher uh, scale of uh, compensation. But uh, I'm not, uh, I haven't heard uh, that there's an agreement already, informal or informal. Or informal. Yeah, but informal is neither here or not there. I agree. Maybe we'll be third time lucky this. I mean, we've, we've gone over time. Maybe there's 
time for one last intervention. But let me make a point that you know we've been saying this to attract investments from China. This is at least the third time it has happened in in my living memory. The first, of course, was when Chinese wages began to go up and China became a high wage economy. And we heard that a number of investments were looking for alternative uh, destinations, and India was touted as one. The second time, of course, was uh, when the Sino-U.S. trade war broke out a couple of years ago. We thought a number of investors would look at India positively, and look at moving out of China. And the third time is now. Maybe we'll be third time lucky. In fact, one of the questions that has come in from Dhanendra Kumar is that we are all talking about long-term measures. To attract investment from China, he's mentioned this 996 uh, rule or guideline of, of of Jack Ma of Alibaba, which is you know work nine to nine, six days a week. You know, is that something can that can be sort of used or implemented in India? But you know, realistically, what are the short term measures that we can take if we look at a narrow sort of canvas? Look, we want to invite industries to India, we want to invite investment to India. And as Professor Hoda said, it doesn't matter whether it's domestic, well, in this case, coming out of China, uh, what's good for domestic investors would probably be good for uh, international investors and, and vice versa. But if you were to look at that narrow scope or narrow canvas, what is it that we can do now uh, to make that possible in the short term? Any sort of thoughts on that? Santosh, Ajayji, Professor uh, uh, I'd again end up repeating myself. The fact is that there are large land banks with the state governments uh, in the states which are seen as attractive. I mean, if you go down the, the Agra Expressway, there are 500 acre lots lying with JP Idol. So, but, but the state has to move in, start doing the infrastructure, go to the, the vendors of Walmart and Walmart saying, here is this place. These are the dead lines on which I will deliver this, this, this. I will train the, your workers. I will pick up the cost. I will start building workers' dormitories. You go into production in six months to a year from now. But, but that kind of mission mode of attracting specific industries to a specific area is something we have not yet attempted. And I think we do it, we are bound to succeed because I say there's the third opening. And this time the, the politics is just right for us. But if, I we, think don't Rajat the, in the if short term, we don't get the physical act together, we, this will bypass us and go to Vietnam. Because one mistake we make, keep making is that we think we are so large. The world does not have other options. The fact is that Vietnam is large enough to be another Germany. So, so, so we are not indispensable to the world. So that we have to recognize and Go the extra mile. In the short term, what we need is to make Luxembourg happen. This news report of uh, Bloomberg that government has identified land of the equivalent in area, something like 200,000 hectare, equal, equal to the area of Luxembourg to be made available for industry. I think this is going to be the shortest route to uh, making a quantum increase in manufacturing in the country. So that is exactly what Ajay uh, ji just said. I think that's exactly what Ajay ji's point is. So there is consensus on the short term measure, at least on this panel. Uh, over to you, Professor Hoda. I think we, we could close this. We've, we've gone way over time. But over to you for, for closing the session. And thank you, Santosh. Thank you, Ajay Shankarji. Thank you, Rajat. And thank, thank you, for, uh, thank you the, all, all of you, the panelists, as well as the participants who have come here and participated today uh, in the uh, uh, webinar on the strategy for manufacturing. I hope uh, we contribute uh, uh, even 1% to 2% to the evolving situation in manufacturing in the country. But let me say that without manufacturing increasing uh, as we have conceived it to be increasing, I think they'll be very difficult. I mean, the people of the country 
the job seekers are going to face a very difficult time. Let us hope that there will be growth in manufacturing and inter alia, it will lead to a lot of jobs being created. Thank you. Thank the you. The webinar is adjourned now. Thank you.